Tunguska, as mysterious as the legend of Atlantis or the sinister Bermuda Triangle. Few historical phenomena have caused so much speculation as this one day in the isolated Siberian forests. An expedition to Tunguska is a journey into the craziest theories and into serious scientific inquiry, the birth and deconstruction of a modern legend. Scientists from many different countries and disciplines are working to find the solution to the puzzle. What happened? For there is still no conclusive evidence and any number of interpretations. Was a meteorite the cause of this terrible destruction, as most scientists believe? But then there would be a crater, and no crater has ever been found. Or was it something quite different? Of course, my favorite theory is the one about a spaceship from another planet. They wanted to visit us and have a picnic here. Then there was an accident and the spacecraft exploded. The theory of a UFO crash won't go away. There are several versions. Theory 42. The Dropa UFO. In the Bayakara Yula Mountains live the diminutive Dropa people, descendants of an extraterrestrial race that crashed landed on Earth many centuries ago. In 1908, their home planet mounted a rescue mission. Unfortunately, the rescue UFO crashed over the harsh taiga landscape. The Dropa still hope one day their people will make an Earth-proof spacecraft. There's so little evidence. It's the lack of hard, solid evidence that makes these theories popular. Benny Pizer is a cultural anthropologist. He teaches at John Moore's University in Liverpool. His specialty is natural disasters and how people cope with them. The Tunguska disaster changed our view of the world and our place in the cosmos because until then we thought that we were basically very protected, that the universe worked like clockwork and that nothing dramatic would happen. But in fact, we now know since Tunguska that we are potentially at the center of cosmic impacts. And they have happened in the past and they might happen in the future. Imagine the Tunguska blast happening over Frankfurt. If a Tunguska-sized object were to detonate over a large city, the entire metropolitan area would be devastated and hundreds of thousands of people would be killed. A new generation of Earth scientists feel the same, like geologist Christoph Brenneisen. If it was a meteorite and the Earth had turned a bit further, it would have destroyed St. Petersburg. An hour later, it would have destroyed Helsinki. One hour later, Stockholm, and after that, Oslo. All these big cities are on the same latitude. And that's one reason it's important to ask, what was really happening here? It was this burning question that first took Christoph Brenneisen from his castle in Germany to the Siberian Tiger in the year 2000 as part of a joint Russian-German expedition. Now he's on his way back to Tunguska to compare the main theories. If it really was a meteorite, he should be able to find material from outer space from soil tests near the epicenter of the explosion. Until now, no such material has been found. Christoph painstakingly notes the likeliest places to search. Maybe his homemade maps will guide him to a great discovery. They depict one of the most isolated regions on Earth. Beautiful, inaccessible and unforgiving. In 1928, Russian mineralogist Leonid Kulik 
was the first scientist to lead an expedition into what was then a disaster area. His pioneering work is still the basis for all later research. In those days, this territory was even wilder than it is today. No one went there if he didn't have to. Over two decades, Kulik and his men tried hard to find evidence for a meteorite impact. Kulik explored this entire area by plane and mapped everything in the greatest detail. He was able to record every tree in the position where it lay after the explosion. And with data like that, it would normally be easy to show where a meteorite landed. Leonid Kulik used all the latest technology to aid him in his search for a crater. He narrowed down his area of interest to a series of small lakes near the epicenter of the explosion. During his research expeditions, Kulik had some lakes completely drained to examine their beds because he thought that these lakes could in fact be craters. But they found tree roots there that had until recently been alive and they were at the bottom of the lakes. How could they have got there? If there had been a meteorite impact, they would have been destroyed. So Kulik concluded that these couldn't be meteorite craters. He was disappointed. Maybe Kulik didn't know what he'd found, that he'd seen the root of the problem. Kulik wanted to continue exploring until he had the solution, but he never got the chance. When the Germans invaded Russia in 1941, Kulik volunteered for the Red Army. He died a prisoner of the Germans a year later. And after the war, the focus changed. The world had seen the atom bomb. Tunguska had a new meaning for scientists and a new place in the science fiction boom. Apart from real science, nearly 40 novels have been inspired by the Tunguska disaster. One became Andrei Tarkovsky's cinema masterpiece, Stalker. There's a meteorite opera from Germany. And this is Russia's top-selling M1 Tunguska anti-aircraft missile tank. If you can't afford a tank, for just $50, you can have another kind of blast, Tunguska Blast, an energy drink made in Florida with, they claim, herbs from Tunguska. Maybe those secret ingredients are radioactive. This is a virtual Tunguska computer game, and it's pretty authentic. It even starts on the Trans-Siberian Express. Well, comrade, are you off to Tunguska too? Uh, yes. Just like geologist Christoph Brenneisen's expedition. Everything about Tunguska is extreme. The temperature varies between minus 40 Celsius in winter and plus 35 in summer. And it's seriously isolated. The Trans-Siberian Express passes more than 700 kilometers away from Vanavara, the nearest town to the explosion. So the next stage is by plane. This is the last bit of comfort Christoph will enjoy for quite a while. Vanavara is the only place to stock up on provisions and find the people to take you safely to the middle of the wilderness. Back in 1908, Vanavara was a bustling fur trading post. Conditions in the taiga, the Siberian forest, were perfect for bears, squirrels, reindeer and wolves. The local event shared the hunting with adventurers from every part of the Russian Empire. This was a country for hardy people, people who didn't mind roughing it.
even in today's Vanavara, there's still a link to the events of 1908. Early in the morning, before the meteorite landed, my great uncle went out and sat on the steps in front of his house. It was summer, and he wanted a little fresh air. He was sitting there when suddenly there was this sound that grew, and soon it was very loud. It made the earth shake. And the rocky comet came down. It came down. There was a loud noise, and it landed 70 kilometers from here, with so much force that my great uncle was thrown several meters from the steps to the fence. But for one group, the experience of the blast was even worse. These were the Evenk, the nomadic reindeer herders, the original people of Tunguska. My great-grandfather was an eyewitness of the explosion. He was in the area where it happened, but he went away. If he'd stayed, because this explosion caused many deaths among the Evenk, whole clans were killed. My clan lived with others here on the Chamba River, and when the rock fell, it was like a nuclear explosion that swept everything away and killed everything. But the Evenk have another explanation. A shaman begged Agdi, their thunder god, to destroy an enemy tribe. Furious at being misused, Agdi sent iron birds against the Evenk, shooting lightning bolts that split the earth. This place is still taboo for the Evenk. Or was it another kind of lightning bolt? Theory 17, the Tesla experiment. The famous or notorious scientist Nikola Tesla is working on a giant transformer in Wardenclyffe, New York. While attempting to demonstrate the unbelievable power of his artificial light beam, he makes a colossal error, which Tunguska has to pay for. At last, Christoph is taking a Mi-8 long-haul helicopter with the warden of the Tunguska Nature Reserve to the epicenter of the explosion. Vanavara, the village that was almost wiped off the map in 1908, is flourishing again. Today, more than 3,000 people live here as hunters, woodworkers, or administering the reserve. A bird's eye view of Tunguska, a completely uninhabited region. From this perspective, the difficulty of the terrain is clear to see. Now, in mid-May, when the snow starts to melt, these endless swamps are especially difficult to cross. A group of scientists, craftsmen and hunters with their dogs are dropped off at one of the nature reserve's lodges. Christoph flies on with two guides towards the center of the impact zone. And here they find Leonid Kulik's hut on the edge of a vast swamp. The pioneering Tunguska scientist was here 80 years ago. Since then, many more have used it as their base camp. The roof of Kulik's main hut has fallen in. But inside, the spirit of the pioneer still lingers. Leonid Kulik may in fact have got closer than he thought to finding evidence of the origins of the blast at Tunguska. But for the Soviet scientists who followed him, everything changed with the detonation of the first atom bomb. After the Second World War, Soviet scientists poured into Tunguska. They were urgently searching for a new kind of evidence, radioactivity or antimatter. 
they used powerful magnets to look for fragments of extraterrestrial metals. They did find particles that could have come from outer space, but they couldn't find any definitive cause for the Tunguska disaster. Maybe the crazy theorists had a better idea for these new times. Theory 43, the time-traveling A-bomb. In the 1970s, a lonely A-bomb got lost. It fell into a time warp and popped out again in distant Tunguska, exploding in 1908 with a pretty respectable bang. But when a real meteorite crashed into another part of Siberia in 1947, everything got more complicated. Because here, they found the crater and parts of the meteorite right away. In Tunguska, it remained defiantly difficult. The scientists had to dig to find out more. But when the ground wasn't frozen hard, the summer marshes, with their millions of mosquitoes, made digging almost impossible and unbearable. And yet, soil samples had to be taken in the interests of the Soviet state, however hard the job. And soil samples continue to be the main research tool today. If there's no cosmic dust on the surface, maybe it can be found in deeper layers, 40 to 60 centimeters down, ground zero in 1908. This is what Christoph Brenneisen is looking for. He's here in the month of May, in the brief period between the ice and the bogs. He hopes that what he's wrapping in his plastic bags is buried matter from outer space. There's one other center of interest for the location of the elusive crater. After the war, attention narrowed again, as it had in Kulik's time, to the lakes that could be candidates for a crater. Here at Lake Cheko, scientists have constantly taken measurements in the water and in the sediments of the lake bed. This led to a new theory from far away Italy. The research group led by Professor Giuseppe Longo at the University of Bologna is now concentrating solely on this lake. Back in 1991, they were the first Western scientists allowed to investigate the impact area. And they have important new ideas about the explosion. We believe that the Tunguska event was caused by an explosion in the atmosphere, either from a rocky meteorite or from a comet. The disintegration of the object in the atmosphere is the reason why no residue of an extraterrestrial body has been found on Earth. But they believe the bigger fragments must still have left some craters. They've spent years looking for matter from space. Now, Giuseppe Longo, fellow physicist Romano Serra, and marine geologist Luca Gasparini are determined to solve the mystery once and for all. They're extremely well equipped. They've already sent divers down to examine the sediment of Lake Cecco, because they're convinced that this is where they will find the final answer to the question, was Tunguska devastated by a meteorite? The shape of the lake seems to confirm their hypothesis. On one side, uh, with our seismic, we saw a lot of sediments. So we were on, I mean, we, we, we agreed uh, with the previous theory that the lake was very old. But on the other side, the shape of the lake is very unusual. It is a funnel-like funnel shape, uh, an inverted cone, 
50 meter by 350 meter. So it is not usual for a um, Siberian lake with our thermocast lake, uh, very flat uh, bottom with a couple of meters maximum depth. This is an aerial shot of the Cheko Lake taken during the annual spring floods. At first, the Italian scientists only looked at microparticles from the lake. But over time, they've developed a model of this entire body of water that looks remarkably like an impact crater. Now they're planning to drill in the lake bed more than 50 meters down. They're confident they'll find something. In the bottom, and this is very important, close to the center, about 10 meters below the bottom, we, found, we find a density anomaly, which is very clear from our seismic data. And this density anomaly could be well related to an overpressure related to the impactor or the impactor itself, which is now buried below 10 meters of sediment. Today, Luca Gasparini and his colleagues judge that this lake is only 100 years old. Only a new expedition can prove whether this half-frozen lake does hold the key to the mystery. Meanwhile, Christoph Brenneisen is starting to have his doubts about the meteorite theory. So far, all his soil tests have been negative. He has found no trace of an object from space. Now he's moving to a new location in the south of the Tunguska Reserve. Because something has been found here that has set Tunguska researchers buzzing. It could be powerful evidence for a quite different theory. Crossing bogland still covered in ice, Christoph reaches the John Stone. It was discovered by John Anfinogenov in 1972. Christoph is certain that this rock doesn't belong here. Its coarse crystalline structure could only have been formed deep underground. There's no connection with the basalt found hereabouts. A rock like this could be what we call an errant block, the sort of thing we see in North Germany. But there was never any classic glacier movement here like in Germany. This stone could only have been brought here by a great explosion. No one's sure where it comes from, but it's not from outer space. And perhaps this man has the explanation. Wolfgang Kunt is an astrophysicist. He lives in Western Germany in the volcanic landscape called the Eiffel. A few years ago, he came up with a daring hypothesis that turned the Tunguska debate on its head. He believes that the John Stone is evidence of an earthbound cause for the Tunguska blast. Kunt has abandoned his own field of astrophysics to commit himself to the volcano theory. I was walking around in Tunguska when I suddenly thought, this is like my home, like the Eiffel. There are plenty of ponds and small lakes, and there are also drier areas, fens, where you can sink in deep, like the dry bogs in the Eiffel. The landscape over there convinced me right away that we must be dealing with a volcanic region. Kunt's theory is based on the volcanic origins of the Tunguska region. He believes that a hundred years ago, molten gases were expelled through volcanic funnels from deep inside the earth. A look at a cross-section of the earth explains it. Outside the solid inner core is the outer core, a layer of molten magma and gases. Kunt believes that superheated magma and gases forced their way through the Earth's mantle via subterranean volcanoes. For thousands of years, these ascending columns of magma were held back by a thick layer of basalt. But in June 1908, under immense pressure, the gas burst through several kilometers of solid basalt rock. The molten magma remained beneath the basalt, and only the gas streamed upwards. A colossal gas storm raged over the Tunguska region. Traveling faster than the speed of sound, the gas reached a height of 200 kilometers. The static electricity that resulted ignited the explosive mix of methane and oxygen. It was not a single event, 
but a storm lasting a quarter of an hour. It absolutely wasn't one event. All the eyewitnesses clearly relate that there was a series of loud events, one after another, and that the whole phenomenon in fact lasted up to one hour. The fact that the event lasted an hour is a serious argument against the meteorite theory. Christoph Brenneisen is now on the track of evidence that could support Wolfgang Kunz's gas explosion theory. He's looking for remains of trees from the disaster year of 1908. There are only a few left in the thick tiger forests, but they provide important information. And they could explain something Kulik noticed 70 years before Professor Wolfgang Kunt in Bonn has developed a theory that a huge gas bubble blasted the moorland upwards, so that these tree roots were hurled hundreds of meters through the area and came raining back down. You can see many of these remains near here. It's quite clearly the effects of the explosion. You can still see the carbonization here on the trunk, while all the other trees around here are younger and show no fire damage. So you could call this a foreign body, an interloper. Could this explain the roots Kulix men found in the lakes all those years ago? Mühlau Castle in eastern Germany. This unlikely place houses the world's only remaining Tunguska Museum. Gottlieb Polzer, physicist and passionate hunter, is its founder. He organized the first Russo-German expedition to Tunguska. He shares part of Kunz's idea, but he takes it further. I believe there must have been a gas explosion there, but not just a gas explosion. It is tempting to posit a variant in which there was a comet with at least two cores. That on entry into the Earth's atmosphere, these cores collided with each other. There was an explosion which unleashed a chain reaction. Perhaps, Pulsar believes, underground gases were released as a result of the impact and were ignited. I believe that a number of different processes then followed. For instance, there is a possibility that there was a mosquito explosion. Yes, you heard that right, a mosquito explosion. In spite of years of research, we haven't heard anything else about a mosquito explosion. But then why not? After all, there are 120 other theories about the Tunguska blast. Theory 79, the black hole. A plucky little black hole decided to flex its muscles and chose Tunguska for the exercise. With an enormous impact, it thudded into Tunguska, bored through the earth, and emerged on the other side, disappearing proud but unacknowledged in deep space. And genuine scientists seem to share some extreme theories. Yuri Lavbin used to run the Tunguska Museum in the Siberian city of Krasnoyarsk until he ran out of money and someone stole his two-ton meteorite, he says. Now he only has little specimens, but he makes big announcements about Tunguska that always manage to attract the headlines. It was here, not in Vanavara in the southern marshes where everyone else looks. It was a giant comet. According to my latest calculations, it weighed a billion tons. It destroyed a technological object, a UFO. How do we know this? Because we have found a photo from outer space. This is the actual site where the destruction took place. You can't find destruction like this in the southern bogs near Vanavara, and there never was any. This destruction is proof. And these are the traces left by the takeoff of the spaceship. It was 25 square kilometers in size. 
It turned, it flew towards the comet, and it exploded. Why? Here's the problem. If the comet, weighing a billion tons, had passed near Earth, it would have brushed the Earth, and all the dust would have climbed into the atmosphere. The atmosphere would have turned dark, the sun would have been covered, and we, imagine, we might never have been born. Close to the takeoff point of the UFO, Lavbin has found a small piece of the spacecraft, a clump of ferrosilicon, he says. If we accept this archaeologist's theory, an alien power sacrificed itself for humanity. A gigantic spaceship and its heroic crew saved us from the killer comet. Yuri Lavbin's is not the only extraterrestrial theory. Theory 92, a message from outer space? In 1883, the volcano of Krakatoa erupted. Aliens in the Swan constellation saw the columns of smoke and took them as a pathetic attempt to get in contact. They replied with an enthusiastic laser beam that made Earth fall in Tunguska. Unfortunately, humanity failed to understand this powerful message. Back to the present, where more and more expeditions are setting off for the region of the explosion. Maybe it has something to do with the beauty of the landscape. Or maybe it's the fact that humans like solving mysteries. This archive footage was shot in summer. Brenneisen's expedition is taking place in May. In spring, some of the rivers are nearly impassable. The Churim Waterfall. It's accessible in this 1950s summer. For Christoph's group, it's a formidable barrier. There's no perfect season for exploring the tiger. Summer brings new dangers, like some very poisonous snakes. Near Churim waterfall, Geologist Valentina Bikova shows her German colleague more remains from the year 1908. Deep in the Tunguska forests, you can still find a few carbonized tree stumps still standing from the 1908 explosion. That evening, Valentina and Christoph examined their freshly gathered samples of soil, stones, and moss. Though Christoph may be becoming a skeptic, Valentina still believes that the explosion was caused by a meteorite. She's convinced it's just a matter of time before scientists find the cosmic dust that will be proof. And she certainly knows about other strange phenomena near this camp at Pristan. About 17 or 18 kilometers from here, from the Pristan camp, on the Kulik road in the direction of Vanavara, there's a place called Idol Mountain. Very strange things happen there. Electronic quartz watches stop working. The display goes out. Quartz watches stop, but mechanical watches keep going. And there have been cases of mass psychosis at this place. People seem to have a nervous collapse and they start to get angry. There are many examples of strange phenomena in Tunguska, but a lot of them can be explained. Christoph Brenneisen is on his way to the highest point in the impact area. Something strange happens here too. This is Mount Farrington, 519 meters high. It makes compass needles turn. North becomes south, east becomes west. 
You can't use a compass or GPS. The phenomenon of the crazy compass turns out to be not so mysterious after all. The stone on the mountain is simply highly magnetic. This geological phenomenon is also seen in other parts of the world. And yet Mount Farrington is one of those places at the epicenter of the explosion that has attracted scientists for decades. And maybe that's partly because of the fantastic views it offers of one of the most remarkable places on Earth. But of course, the scientists don't really come here for such romantic reasons. People have long said that plants and trees grow exceptionally fast here, and according to local people, the soil of Tunguska is an extremely effective fertilizer. But there's more. Soviet scientists in the atomic age took up a new study. They became interested in studying the mutations in flora and fauna in the Tunguska region. In the 50s, they discovered that the trees had broader annual rings since the year 1908 than in the years before the explosion. And Christoph himself has even discovered a genetic mutation in the growth of pine needles. I have here needles of the Priestan pine that usually grow in even numbers, two, four, but not what you see here, for example, five, or even three. So there will be a lot of things to look at here. Even the magnetic storms we can observe here that put our compasses and GPS devices temporarily out of action could trigger a mutation. Of course, there are also mutations that take place because of normal stresses in nature, like changes in food supply, humidity, cold, etc. But the mutations pile up to such an extent in the event region that you start to wonder about other causes. Mutations and increased growth can also be seen after an atomic explosion or radioactive contamination. So Soviet scientists measured their tree rings, burned them and analyzed the ashes. They couldn't find any clear evidence of a nuclear explosion or large-scale radioactive damage. But that has not discouraged the nuclear disaster fans among the Tunguska theorists. Theory 21, atom bomb test. Europe at the beginning of the 20th century. It started with a secret military collaboration between the Russian Tsar and his cousin, the Prussian Kaiser. They would develop an enormously powerful atom bomb. Unfortunately, the bomb's developers, together with their blueprints in the whole of Tunguska, went up in the very first test explosion. And the emperors were soon in no position to commission any further experiments. Sandia National Laboratories in Albuquerque, New Mexico, is a weapons research center. Here, Mark Boslow has developed the most sophisticated of all models to explain the Tunguska phenomenon. He believes he can answer the question once and for all. The Tunguska explosion, I think, was caused by the impact of a large comet or asteroid with the atmosphere. Um, it came into the atmosphere, it broke apart, it exploded before it hit the ground. And the explosion generated a lot of light and a lot of heat, and it generated a strong blast wave that created winds at the surface that were so strong that they blew down trees. And the heat uh, ignited some of these trees and created a fire. Um, so I think the Tunguska event is fully explainable in terms of the impact of an asteroid or comet. Mark Boslow's model of a meteorite explosion at an altitude of 5 to 10 kilometers is not new. What is new is that Boslow can test it with a state-of-the-art computer simulation without leaving the lab. I think the reason there was no crater, uh, no obvious crater, was because the comet or asteroid expended all its energy and exploded at high altitude. So there was really nothing left to hit the ground. Um, crater forming 
impacts require that something solid actually collide with the ground, um, it doesn't appear that that happened in the case of Tunguska. So there's no crater to be seen, but according to Boslo, there's no need for a crater. What scientists did see was knocked over trees. Kulik's archive photos and film provide a great deal of information. They've inspired generations of scientists to use the pattern of tree collapse to establish the exact position of the explosion. In the 1950s, models were tested in a pressure chamber. This model clearly shows an area in the middle of the blast where the trees remained standing, an extremely convincing argument for no crater. And Mark Boslow has fed this data too into his computer. Here is a mid-air explosion seen from the side with its blast wave. You can clearly see how it spares the trees immediately below. Our simulations show a very strong blast wave coming, coming down from the sky, and it's, it's radiating from a, a place in the sky. And as that blast wave hits the ground, there's a component of very high wind blowing radially outward from, from the center, from ground zero. And so that's the direction that the trees blow down. So they're basically laying down in a radial pattern uh, directed away from ground zero. And that would explain a strange phenomenon, why some of the trees remain standing. They were right underneath the explosion, stripped of their branches, but still there. And to provide the final explanation, a scientist must also take into account the strange light phenomena connected to Tunguska. From Moscow to London, for three nights after the 30th of June, people could read their newspapers outside at midnight. A hundred years on, we know that a giant dust cloud from Tunguska was carried by the east winds of the thermosphere across Europe, reflecting the sun's light back down to Earth. Mark Boslow sees this phenomenon as further support for his meteorite theory. He believes his computer model can explain that too, using information from the other side of the solar system. We modeled the impact of Shoemaker-Levy 9 on Jupiter, the comet that collided with Jupiter in 1994. And one of the outcomes of our model was a giant ballistic plume that was ejected into space. And that plume rose to a very high altitude, something like 3,000 kilometers, and then collapsed on top of Jupiter's atmosphere. And it had a lot of dust and material in it that reflected sunlight. And we think a very similar phenomenon occurred at Tunguska. But astrophysicist Wolfgang Kunt doubts that a meteorite explosion could cause three nights as bright as day across all Europe. He believes this phenomenon can only be explained by light volcanic gases. For that, you need particles in the high atmosphere, where no comet dust and no asteroid dust can remain. Up there, you get light ice crystals, like the ones gently falling on our heads. They can be carried up there by hydrogen and helium and methane. They can stay up there for days. Whichever piece of evidence you examine under the microscope, the supporters of the meteorite theory will claim it for themselves. And so will Wolfgang Kunt for his underground gas theory. Incidentally, the meteorite people are clearly in the majority. And the team from Bologna are facing their moment of truth. They plan to test their theory right there on location. You can easily test it. I mean, you go there, you dig, and you find <laughs> yes or no, is a matter right or not. If it had fallen to Earth, we would have found something. 
There have been so many scientific expeditions and scientists. I think the Earth simply barged it away. The world is round, and in those days it was healthy, not like today. An explosion from inside the Earth, a volcanic explosion. For me, that's the only interpretation that is consistent with all the facts we have in our possession. But for some, like Benny Pizer, that's not really the point. Regardless of what actually happened in Tunguska, even if it wasn't an asteroid, asteroids actually exist. And asteroids actually hit the Earth and actually explode in the atmosphere. We observe asteroids exploding in the atmosphere all the time. If it does collide with the Earth, it's probably going to be over the ocean or over an uninhabited place. Um, there are so many other natural disasters, such as hurricanes, volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunami, and so forth, that have a much, much higher rate of, and, and a much, much higher probability of happening and creating catastrophes. And so, in a relative sense, these aren't something that we should really spend a lot of time worrying about. But Mark Boslow has never been to Tunguska. When you have, like Christoph Brenneisen, it doesn't let you go. And luckily for him, there's no sign of a solution soon. I came here as a supporter of the meteorite theory, but I've had to change my mind. I have no answer. Science has no answer. There are fashions that come and go. One moment it's a meteorite, one moment it's a comet, or it has an endogenous earthbound cause. I haven't been able to solve the mystery, and I don't think anyone else will in the near future. Even after a hundred years, debate about the Tunguska disaster shows no sign of slowing. In fact, it's getting livelier than ever, and Tunguska is getting ready for still more expeditions. Whether they'll find anything remains to be seen. And so for the time being, the Tunguska legend lives on. That's what legends are for. <laughs>